Yes, we are here gathered today, the last day of the conference. How's it been so far? I'm sorry, what? Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us here Sunday morning. We know that it takes a lot of energy to come on the last morning and come in with all your energy and your full selves, and we're really excited to have this workshop with you today. My name is Andrea Quijada. I'm the executive director of the Media Literacy Project from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we're really excited to be here with you. You are in the right room if you are here to talk about media literacy for mobilization. Yes? Media literacy for mobilization. Great. We, we're going to be talking about pop ed today. And, popul and um, pop ed or popular education is a tool for engaging and supporting community-based organizing. And all the organizations that you're going to hear from this morning will be talking about and sharing examples and tools on how we use popular education within the communities that we're part of and work with in, in, in our struggles for media justice across the country. So you're going to hear from different regions and you're going to hear from amazing, amazing organizations. And really popular education in and of itself um, is ultimately about social change. And it really provides inspiration and hope to communities and it takes everyone's knowledge and really creates sort of this level playing field around all the knowledge that we all bring and each bring into any space is valuable and honored. And we create ways in which everyone can then contribute to a conversation. And this morning we're gonna get started we're going to hear first from Jessica Collins and also from Carlos Pareja. So I'm going to quickly introduce them. And Jessica Collins, who's right next to me, um, you want to raise your hand? Yeah. Uh, she joined the Media Literacy Project in 2003 and has trained hundreds of youth, educators, and community leaders on media literacy topics, including gender, race, sexuality, violence, reality television, and digital storytelling. Jessica also currently runs our Girl Tech Collective program. We're in our second year where she works with young women of color on reproductive justice and video making. Woo woo. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and Carlos Pareja is a media activist, a fabulous colleague, an educator and filmmaker who has worked with both adults and youth teaching video production and media literacy and organizing around media access. And currently, Carlos is the training and policy director for People's Production House out of New York. Woo woo! So we're gonna get started, we're gonna hear from these two and as we uh, continue forward, I'll be in introducing folks. Um, and I really encourage and I really appreciate everyone sitting as close to the circle as possible. And I re really want to thank everyone for, for making that happen. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over. Okay. Great. All right. So for some of the folks that came in late, I have a few more bingo sheets. Everyone should have one of these sheets because we're going to start off with an activity here. And so how this is going to work is... Each person is going to not answer these for themselves, but you're going to go around and ask other people. Here you go. Here, if you could just pass these around. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so everyone's gonna get up and you're going to ask someone in the room um, so, for example, you'll say, "Have you? did you grow up with a rotary dial phone? If they say yes, then you get that bingo square. And you're going to ask them for their name, write their name down, and mark that. And you can do horizontal, vertical, diagonal. And if you get a bingo, I want you to yell bingo. Okay, and we have prizes for each person that gets bingo. So if someone gets bingo, we're just going to keep going. And, and many people in the room, I, I, I'm assuming, are going to get bingo. So does this make sense? So, and we have five minutes. Uh, different people. So you want to talk to as many people as you can. That's a great question. Yes. Let's, let's, let's make it a little harder and not do four corners, because there's a lot of people in the room, there's a lot of knowledge in the room. So let's just do, yeah, so that you have to get five instead of four. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Five minutes, get your bingo sheets out. I knew I was gonna run out. <laughs> 
like this looks like more than 50 people. I know. <laughs> I know. Girl. Wow, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like you to just take a moment to share with folks around you. Uh, don't necessarily say anything. I just want to give folks an opportunity to actually see what you've drawn. Uh, and as you're watching other people's drawings, I want you to think about, are there things that connect um, with your drawings? Are there similarities? Um, are there things that stand out to you as being you know, vastly different? Um, so in a, in a silent manner, please, uh, share with each other you know, your drawings and just, uh, and just reflect for a moment. Thank you. I said silently. <laughs> I said silently. Well, that's part of the process. So I, I will explain what I will ha what I would have done with um, with the space if the space would have allowed. What I was planning on doing is having you actually put them up on the wall and create like an art gallery, and that would have forced you to kind of walk through and just check out everybody's work. So I had to improvise. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Roberta Rael who's going to follow us through the, a, a little bit of reflection, and then, um, and then we'll head into her piece as well. Thank you. I'm just curious. How many of you enjoy drawing? How many of you, like, this, this really r resonated with you in terms of an exercise, a way of expressing yourselves? OK. All the people in the front, a couple people in the back. All right. So how many of you are like, yeah, it's all right. You know, like, I'll do it because I was asked. Raise your hands. It's all right to be honest. But I asked nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I know for myself that sometimes when I'm given these kinds of exercises, I'm like, but, you know, when I was growing up and being taught, like, I, I, there was all kinds of oppression around education. And so if I couldn't draw right, like what was drawing right, um, then it's like there's all this stigma about drawing. And so some of us, you know, get like a block. So stick figure. So I see a few heads nodding. Um, 
nonetheless, I'm going to come back now to the exercise. I just wanted to do that check-in, and, and I'll explain a little bit more in a bit. But who would like to share something about what they drew today? Jay. <laughs> the other one is like, don't even use it. And the other one is like this giant cell phone where, you know, that. So a giant sh cell phone on your back, you with a leash, and the cell phone. It actually should be the cell phone with you on the leash. The cell phone with you on the leash. Very good. Very creative. Somebody else. And the other mic. Could I get the other mic over there? If you don't mind holding on. It's on. Oh. Joseph, would you help me pass that, please? Thank you. Well, uh, I can draw. Uh, definitely, I, I, I'm really bad with that. And so that's why I just do this. I need an app to draw. That's what I need. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> I do everything by my cell phone. So I need, a, I need an app to draw. <laughs> Thank you. Very creative. Okay. And then I have this woman right in the front, if you'd like to share. And Joseph, thank you. Um, mine is, um, well, what I thought was interesting is that, I don't, what is your name? Eric. Eric. <laughs> Eric and I, uh, we weren't working together, but when we compared our, our drawings, I, I was just thinking that it was kind of a time travel. I mean, neither of us have a, a stick figure or a human element. <laughs> but they're, uh, I'm gonna hold yours up. Wow, very interesting. So they're, they're like maps. Or mine is kind of, a, is like a mind map, and his is a... Uh, uh, I drew like, a, like an A to B linear thing for the connection, but then I realized we're both connected to everything at the same time, so it was like the infinity sign around the lines. Mm. And then I do a time thing, because I always feel like I'm pressed for time when I'm on my phone. Yeah. Hourglass. So the hourglass. Awesome. OK, I know that there's a few other that, of you that would like to share, but um, I'm going to go move ahead. So thank you very much for those of you who shared. Very interesting. Very interesting. How we perceive these items that are supposed to be tools for us. Tools for us that suddenly have us on a leash. Tools that are supposed to help us save time in our lives, create more time. And that's questionable for some of us. And tools that make us think about more tools to create, as you did. Very, very interesting. So another question I'm, I'm curious about is, as you drew, did you learn something about yourself? Was this a good way to self-reflect a little bit? Anybody, if you just raise your hands, do you feel like you kind of learned or it felt like self-reflection? Raise your hands high. It's still early in the morning. OK. All right. Um, I want to kind of jump back to what is popular education and why popular education. I've been um, working in this realm for probably all of my life. I grew up in northern New Mexico, up in the mountains, in a very small community of about 1,000 people. 500 of them were my relatives. <laughs> Dating was tough. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I grew up in a very traditional way um, as a Chicana, as um, a person who is indigenous to that land in northern New Mexico. And um, very, very strong roots, very, very strong values. And some of the things that I realized that I was ingrained with were later I learned were in this framework, this theoretical framework that is called popular education. And some of the components of that are respect, mutuality, 
And so as, as earlier we were talking with you about it, everyone is a learner and everyone is a teacher. That's mutuality. So it doesn't matter in some ways when you approach your work with that basic value of mutuality that if you are different from each other, different in terms of age, different in terms of culture, different in terms of um, background, different in terms of life experience, different in terms of race. If you approach the work from a place of mutuality, then you put yourself in being the student and a, lear and a learner and also the opportunity to share and that some of what you share may teach somebody else. So my work with young people, even though I'm old enough to be their mother, maybe some of them even their grandmother, I'm, I feel like um, I'm always the one learning from them and they are learning from me. And there's different roles that we play sometimes with each other, like I'm in a different role at times as the executive director, but that I'm not at a higher level than them that it's very much as human beings, as spirits on this earth, that we are mutual beings. And so keeping that in check in the rush of the world that we live in is challenging sometimes. Because it's like, I gotta get the proposal written. Or I've gotta get you know this thing done so that then I can do the other thing that needs to get done. So that piece of self-reflection is critical um, in terms of looking at the other component, I think, of popular education, is intentionality. What is the intention of the work that we are doing together? So, for example, today, um, we thought about which activities to do. And I think sometimes in the rush of our stuff, the rush of our work and the rush of the world and the thing that we think that we are saving more time because we've got all of these tools that actually cloud up our minds more and cloud up our hearts more because we're just so busy all the time, we forget that there has to be intention behind what we do versus it's an activity to do. It's an activity for activity's sake. And when we step back and we have that self-reflection and say, oh, but there's got to be intention. What's the intention of this particular activity? What's the goal? What am I trying to accomplish with this particular activity in this particular space today? And that takes more time. And I know that for my own self, that when I'm not um, ref doing the reflective work that I need to do, I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to do my reflection. I suffer from insomnia because I haven't had time in, day, in my day to just like be and reflect and say, oh, that was good, or oh, God, I really screwed up on that one today. Like, I've got to go make that right. So it comes up at 3 o'clock in the morning when, you know, as human beings, our bodies are supposed to be resting and our minds are supposed to be kind of recharging. So those are kind of the, like, the pieces of it. Um, the work in terms of that intentionality is going back to the conception, I think, of conscientización, to raise the consciousness, to raise the consciousness of whatever we do, however, whatever work we're about, and whatever piece of our day that we're in, to raise a piece of, like, together consciousness to move forward in a positive way. I'd like to hear from some of you, because I'm, I know that we're all using popular education. This is not new. I'd like to hear from some of you what are some of the other aspects, components, or concepts of popular education that you use. Thank you. Physical hands-on learning. Thank you. Physical hands-on learning. I can give an example of that. Of um, 
we I teach seventh graders, and instead of trying to teach hip hop or understanding that, we brought in um, we had a whole spotlight day, and the kids learned street dance, and they did graffiti art on the art room wall, <laughs> um, and then they also deconstructed um, music videos too. But it was much more hands-on, giving them the experience to learn from it. Thank you. I've got a couple of hands in the back and right, one right here on the side. Well, I got here a little bit late, so I'm, I'm not sure. I think this fits in with what you're saying, though I think I can give an example of mutuality. That would be part of the public education. Um, I'm a co-editor of our local newspaper at home, and uh, we're briefly a citizen journalism project. So we're bringing in people who have never oh, sorry we're bringing in people who have never done reporting before, and you know training them from you know getting the story all the way through editing and going to press with it, and you know there's a certain element I think of of letting go on our end where. You know, we give them some of the, the tools and we answer the questions and we get them prepared to do the work. And then we kind of throw them in the pool and teach them how to swim. There's a certain point at which you just have to let go and there's no other way to swim but just getting in the water and doing it. And then the mutuality aspect, they come back and before we can go to press with their story, they have to teach us what they learned from the very beginning of their research and interviews all the way to the draft that they have turned in. So in order for them to finish, they have to teach us as the editors what it is that they found and learned. And that's a, a big part of it. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to take um, the other, I think there was another hand here and the gentleman um, sitting right here. Um, and so they learn a little bit of troubleshooting and they learn a little bit of, you know, how their computer works. Mm -hmm. And if they express any interest in what they've done, if they express any interest in what they've learned, uh, then we ask them personally to come back to volunteer uh, to continue learning and to help other uh, users at the help desk. So we, we kind of try to, nice. you know, re replace our volunteers as we go along. Yeah, creating circles of, okay, teachers and learners. Okay, I'm gonna take one more, the woman back here. Yes. I don't know if I We're, I think it's all being recorded, so that's the purpose of it. Well, thank you, I sh totally share your vision and I'm uh, appreciative of your spirituality aspect of it. What I started to do in the college level, um, after watching a couple of kids come in, I think one kid had a T-shirt on that said, if you're not a computer, don't talk to me. <laughs> and uh, then I had another kid throw his phone across the room because his girlfriend was texting him and he was getting all flustered and he threw the phone and he said, you know, when we start communicating with our thumbs, we're in big trouble. And um, based on that, as you said, we're learners and we're teachers, I developed um, an interpersonal communication course and um, we do conference room style. Uh, the phones go in a bowl before they enter into the room. So again, coming back to that, what I've learned from my students is they're very much not understanding some of the fundamental skills of the communication process. Mm -hmm. And it's literally been heartbreaking. Breaking. I have had students pull me aside uh, n really not being able to navigate around Facebook, uh, emailing me saying, gosh, can you, can you explain why I have to have my Facebook tab up all the time? I can't, I, and the emotional turmoil, you're, you've already have your fundamental communication skills and you feel like you have a leash with your phone. And what I'm finding right now is that there is such a, desperate need for kids to uh, really connect, understand the communication process, um, get that face time, and when I'm telling you, they're, they're almost twitching when they have to sit down at a conference room style table and look each other in the eye. 
um, it's it's frightening. And yeah. we're it, it, um, at the end of my, my class, it's it's turned into Facebook group therapy. Yeah. And. Um, Everyone's really upset, so I started an organization called EmbraceAndLetGo.org, and I just started it. So, Thank uh, you. this is college. This is 18 to 21. So, four years ago was when we started communicating with our thumbs. Right. Okay. So these are the. This is a social science experiment that I'm watching, and I've had kids that after my course. They've gotten off of Facebook, and then they find me in the hall, and they're like, you know what? I had to get back on because I don't know how to connect with my friends. And uh, the deconstruction of the commercials are, are so interesting because what we've done in the class is taken the, um, all the, the phone commercials and really been able to analyze and say, what is it? that they're actually selling. Thank you so much. And it's Just the connection. It's exact, that's right. The ex it's the, it's the connection. And lo and behold, we still have to talk to each other. Okay. And we do have to listen to each other. So I really appreciate your, your input and I appreciate what you've just taught the rest of us because the room was engaged with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And anyone who wants to help me or uh, we're working on a documentary film, so <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but that's what we're going to use because so people need to learn viscerally. So the point that I'm hearing you make is the last point that I'll um, highlight, and that popular education is a tool for community building. It's a tool to build a space where we can connect with each other as community. And you use activities, you use um, learning, you use creative ways. But the real piece of this, in order to have social justice and media justice come together at that interception, it is about us being a community of people. And so um, thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'm going to pass it back to Andrea now. Thank you to Roberta and Steven for that. Thank you so much. Can we hear it? Give it up for them one more time. <laughs> Next up, we're going to hear from Milena Velis, who is an organizer, media literacy educator, and multimedia journalist with the Media Mobilizing Project. Philly, we have Philly. Any folks from Philly here? Okay. She spends her days teaching media and digital literacy skills with people in poor communities across Philly and working to connect the leaders of fragmented struggles in communities across the region. A co-producer of Labor Justice Radio, Milena also works with the Prometheus Radio Project to guide groups around the country in applying for full power FM radio licenses. Let's give it up. Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, I want to start out with a few questions, and if these questions apply to you, um, if you could either raise, raise your hand, just to start out with a few things. So raise your hand if you've ever produced a piece of video. All right, lots of people, right? Um, that's why we're here. Um, raise your hand if you um, know how to, um, raise your hand if you actually, if you think that the mainstream media misrepresents your issues or your communities. All right. Raise your hand if you know how to use a mouse. OK, OK. Um, so the reason I'm asking these questions is because as educators, I want, am I holding the mic right? It's OK, right? Can you hear me? OK. Um, as educators, um, I want you to think about the process that goes from taking somebody who doesn't know how to use a mouse to being able to produce a piece of video. Right? And not just any piece of video, but a piece of video that um, represents their issues in their communities in ways that the mainstream media isn't. Right? So that's kind of, um, in a nutshell, the educational work that we do. Um, and if you can think about the steps that that takes, right? and the kind of time that takes, um, and the kind of attention that takes, um, that gives you a big idea of the day-to-day the -day educational work that we do at the Media Mobilizing Project. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the work we do. Um, the Media Mobilizing Project is based in Philadelphia, right? Um, we are dedicated to building a media infrastructure for, for and by a movement to end poverty. And I can tell you a little bit about what that means, right? Um, so I want to make two points to start off. First, um, one point is that as, as educators, 
um, as media makers um, in Philadelphia, we find ourselves in a unique position of being in relationship to lots of different issues, different communities, different organizations, right? So as media makers, um, we have radio programs, um, video news, blog, um, and we, you know, we're covering the issues that are going on, the organizing that's going on in the city, um, the, you know, the fights that are, that are coming up around everything from immigration to the, the city budget to education, um, stuff like that, right? And as educators, we're, t we're training poor and working people in the city um, from everything about how to use a mouse, right? How do you open up the computer and, and you know, how do you get onto the internet? What, I what is the, the URL bar? How do you type in an address um, to, you know, how do you really use the media in your organizing? Um, and this is putting us in a, in, a, in a relationship with all these groups. And I think this goes for a lot of the people in this room. And it, it creates a unique opportunity to be able to put those groups in relationship to each other um, and to create something bigger by putting all those organizations in relationship to each other um, to strategize together and build something bigger together. Um, another thing I want to point out right, on the topic of popular education is that um, one of, the, one of the philosophical underpinnings of popular education is the idea that people are experts. People know things about their experience, about their situation, right? Um, they don't need to be taught a lot of things. They just need to be, um, people, people know and have expertise, right? So a few things that I've found that people know um, in the educational work we do is people, just like everyone here, understand that the m mainstream media does not represent them and does not work for their interests, right? People who are organizing, um, in a union, for example, know that they're going to be represented as, as greedy. Um, people who are fighting for their rights as immigrants know that the mainstream media is going to show them as people who don't deserve basic human rights. Um, people know this because it affects their lives, their real lives. Um, people who are poor also know that the reason they don't have internet access, right, the reason they don't have computers, the reason they might not have ever had a chance to learn how to use these things, um, is because of the same reasons that they, you know, have to um, fight for basic education, um, fight to keep their homes, um, you know, the same kind of economic inequality and problems of poverty, right? Um, so for us, the question with popular education is what do you do with this knowledge? How do you take it a step further, right? How do you take the stuff that people know and take it further um, to build something more? So um, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about um, just like an example, a story about someone who's a big, uh, a really important leader in our work, um, sort of as an example of the kind of work we do and what we're about, right? So um, I'm going to talk about Amendu Evans, who's someone I've worked with for the last three years. Um, he's a co-producer of Labor Justice Radio, um, which is a, a show that I produce too. Um, so when we met Amendu three years ago, um, he was a shop steward at SCIU Janitors Union. Right? Um, so a shop steward, for people who don't know, is somebody who is basically on the, um, in the workplace. Right? He's a, a worker in the union, but he's the person who's kind of the intermediary between the union and, um, or between the workers and the union structure. So he's the person who's always sticking up for everybody when, um, when like, the management isn't enforcing the contract. Right? So the person who's always on the front line there. So um, he's a shop steward and a, and a cleaner in, a build, in an office building. Um, and he became a producer um, of Labor Justice Radio, right? So there was lots of barriers to that that we had to, he had to overcome and we had to, you know, work with him to overcome. Um, one of them being technical skills, right? Computer skills, um, to be able to make a radio piece and podcast it, um, put it up on the internet, right? Um, from having very basic computer skills to doing, being able to do that. Other, um, other barriers are, you know, being a shop steward means you have to be 100% at your job every single day because they're always going to look for a reason to, to fire you because of the, the organizing work you're doing. Um, and um, so through this, this kind of um, our work, you know, not just teaching technical skills, right, not just teaching him how to, you know, produce a radio piece, but also um, developing someone as a leader in our network. Um, Amendu has been able to integrate these radio skills, right, into leadership, not just of the union, but of the city um, and of a larger movement and moving media policy fights as well. So what that looks like, right, is um, if he's covering, for example, um, the, the foreclosure issue in the city, um, he's coming in contact with information about how people can keep their houses. And that information is something that is really important for his members, right? 
um, but it's a leadership role of being the media maker, the, the connector in that, in that situation. Um, and um, yeah, and for example, another, you know, another example of this kind of thing is he's a leader in a, in a labor committee right now helping support other union struggles across the city. So not just doing this one thing, but, but a, broader, a broader leadership. Um, and all right, so to wrap up, um, all right, let me get my thoughts together. Um, so another, so yeah, what I want to leave you with is to talk about um, our most recent work with computer centers um, on the topic of also media policy and why this is important. Um, so Amendu, for example, is going to be a, um, a site organizer at one of our computer centers, which is a community center um, for computer access. And I'm um, going to be you know, using that space, not just to provide people with computers, but also to be an organizer for that neighborhood, the community center where the computer center is, right? Um, and what I want to leave you with is that this is the kind of work that for us really connects our communities to policy issues, right? So when, um, you know, we're, we're in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood, in a low-income neighborhood, um, giving people computer access um, and really working with them on that, that is what really connects people to the issues of, well, why don't I have this anyway? Why, do I, why can't I afford this in my home, right? Um, why do I have to, um, to fight to just be able to, to communicate, right? Um, when, you, when you're someone who's podcasting and who's, who's using the media, using radio, and seeing how that strengthens your organizing, um, you understand really on a really basic level why um, media consolidation is working against your interests, right? And why you need to fight against that. Um, for example, if you're a taxi driver who's trying to listen to the radio show um, that's produced by fellow workers, um, and we have a one-watt radio station in Philadelphia right now, and you can't pick it up um, unless you're driving between like a certain 10-block radius, you understand why media consolidation, why, why we need low-power FMs, right? Why this is something that's going to affect your life and make your, your organizing stronger. Um, so and basically what we, what we try to do is to make make people understand and see and live why they need to fight for these media policy issues. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have Tracy Rosenberg, who has worked at Media Li as Media Alliance's executive director since 2007. She has organized and advocated for a free, accountable, and accessible media system focusing on the protection and sustainability of alternative media outlets. She has monitored the mainstream media for accuracy and fair representation and has facilitated the training of numerous nonprofit organizations and citizens groups in effective communications. Tracy. So thank you guys for hanging out here on the last day. So I guess this makes me officially the last speaker of the last panel of the entire conference pretty much. <laughs> Call it the caboose. Um, so I'm going to make this fairly fast because I know people are, people are tired and already thinking about the airport. But I want to say a couple of things to sort of kind of wrap us up and bring us into a close. If you haven't gotten it by now, and I'm guessing that you probably have, um, what we're trying to do here is sort of provide a different entry point into all of the issues that you guys have been hearing about for days and days. Because I know a bunch of you probably went to the What's Up with Net Neutrality panel and you probably went to um, building community controlled infrastructure or perhaps that one scared you and you didn't. But, <laughs> but you walked into some kind of wonky techie geek policy panel because you're here and you can't really help it. And that's great, but you are the people who come to a media reform conference. You are. And because of that, that kind of presentation, while tremendously informative, draws on a whole series of things that you're walking into the room with. The question for me, as someone who's trying to sort of organize around these kinds of issues in California, which is 3,000 miles from Washington with a whole bunch of people sort of saying, well, okay, but what can I really do about it from here? Is how do we sort of turn that on its head and make something compelling? Because it seems to me that after, you know, years and years of walking into panels with sort of a balloon over my head that goes net neutrality, why it's important and what's at stake, 
to you know 90 million groups it's a lot better when they tell me what's at stake than when I tell them what's at stake and that's essentially what's at the heart of popular education and why it's important because you guys for what it's worth you designed the perfect cell phone you designed something that will sell to everybody everybody will buy that phone the only problem is unless you make it yourselves it will never be manufactured and the question about sort of why that is why the consumer products that would work for us why the things that would make our lives work better why the things that in a capitalist system should already have happened don't happen is really at the heart of sort of the policy disconnects that we have and a media system that doesn't work in the public interest in the slightest in any way shape or form i would also say that when we're talking about sort of policy if policy in all areas not just this sort of came up from a process like we've gone through here where people said here's what's not working for me rather than from a process of what people think will get through Washington or get through Sacramento or get through um, through Albany we would have better policy if the framing around policy came from what people said in rooms like this we would have had a better term for net neutrality than the one that we ended up with <laughs> And that's not a critique. That's just a sort of a statement about the affirmation of what's important about what we're talking about here. And that it's not just reaching out to youth, although that's really important. It's about sort of the basis in which the policy fights that we engage on, where they're coming from, what they're coming out of, and what values they're really attached to. And if they're attached to the right values, then I think the policy fights go much smoother and we're not stuck with with a stupid name like net neutrality that we can't escape from because that didn't come from you guys that's not what you guys said nobody asked you that's the problem um, so that said um, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, broadband policy uh, we do have eventually when it's done and it was supposed to be done for now and it's not um, a toolkit coming out on digital inclusion called Broadband for the People through the Media Action Grassroots Network. And I hope that all of you will um, sign up, get on our mailing list, consider joining Magnet. This is, this is an important part of the movement as a whole. And it's an important coalition in terms of sort of defining w what we're doing so that the connection to the basic values and to an inclusive process remains intact and it has to be intact because we won't succeed with reforming the policy unless it's based on a grounded progressive movement that is larger um, but it's not ready number one and number two we are out of time so let me just say that all of the things that apply to cell phones apply to the to the larger internet platform in spades net neutrality is important with its bad name and the issue of sort of who controls the infrastructure and what are the workarounds for sort of civic engagement on basically platforms that are owned by vicious corporations that hate us and what are we going to do about that you know where is sort of the ownership for the people i mean that's really the important questions so that said we want to know what you guys thought of this workshop and how this popular education worked for you. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Um, I'm gonna ask you to sort of split yourselves into a couple of, what's the word? Split yourselves into a couple of different modalities and start first with what did you hear today, if anything, that made you feel something kind of intensely, whatever that might be. And it might have made you feel really pissed off. It might have made you feel really inspired. It might have made you feel really shocked. I don't know. Um, but since there's like still 50 or 60 people in the room, I'm thinking maybe the first five volunteers that I can cajole from the crowd. Okay. So basically, if you want to be an evaluator of 
record, you're going to have to be fast. But we'll do four or five. And as much as possible, a span of people across the room, like I'd like to hear from one person who's under 30, and I'd like to hear from one person who's over 60, and um, those kinds of things. And so, OK, volunteer number one. Your hand was up. I saw it. I just got an email from a friend um, about the fact that we had a We Are One rally at our Capitol last, before I came here. And, you know, labor, AFL-CIO. And he said, well, there weren't enough young people there. And I emailed him back, and he's also a media person justice person and he I said I'm sitting in a room full of young people who are working on media justice so it's very exciting and very okay. good who's number two oh, okay in the back there okay I'll, I'll make the out there. hi yes Sorry, I just wanted to say uh, don't give up on Washington and don't give up on your local state legislator I'm not to say anything contrary to what's already been spoken about but you're your face-to-face -face meeting with them and their staffers okay. means a whole lot to them. Uh, I've been to Washington. It's staffed by young people. Okay, and guys. To show up there is great. Okay. It's great. I understand that we all want to get our opinions in, but we're trying to talk about this workshop and what happened for you here. Okay, on the floor. Over there, um, blonde hair, orange, orangey shirt. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> the thing that you guys talked about that resonated with me the most was the talk about respect and, and mutuality because if, if you honor what other what your students and what the people that you're talking to already know, then you start out in a much better place. And, and I thought that that was really significant and important. Okay, over there. I just, I really like the workshop where we designed the phone and um, there was a moment before before somebody brought up the sustainability issue when I just felt it boiling up inside me that like I want a phone that doesn't exploit the planet and people and um, when somebody said it before I did it reminded me that things that go on things that I'm frustrated that go unsaid mm -hmm. at conferences like this other people are feeling the same way cool. and we can find each other afterwards yeah cool okay last one down here I also really liked the um, the cell phone piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, I m come from a media literacy organization in New York City, mm -hmm. and we do a lot of work with young kids where cell phones are the way that they get into the internet, and they truly don't know what to do without them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think finding tools to be able to integrate mobile phones into classroom education, um, but also how they can mobilize and they can ask for things like better broadband access and the types of cell phones that they want. Um, I think learning tools like that would be really valuable Okay, as well. Well, I was actually trying to break it up into thoughts and feelings, but you guys are so articulate that both come at the same time, which is great. Um, let's do two more, and then we will pretty much be out of time. So there's one over here. Um, what resonated for me was entry point, um, because I think we're, we're talking about people who may not have access to internet. And um, I work with libraries, so we're, in, we're an entry point for people. Um, so that's the thing that resonated most. Cool. OK, last word. All right, over there. <laughs> the thing that resonated most for me was a talk about space and needing to have that time to reflect. And um, it made me feel really good. I mean, it hit me in the gut. And um, one reason is because we're working on a, a media fast in another week and a half, which is to try and refrain from media, at least outside of school and work. But just remembering how much as important it is to work on media, it's important to take a break. OK. Thanks, guys. I'm going to hand it over to Andrea. And it was great to meet you all. Great. We just wanted to give a big thank you to all of you for hanging in. This is the last day. We had no idea how many people were going to show up today. We are completely honored and humbled that so many of you came in and showed up. So thank you. Big applause to you all. 
wanted to share that all of the organizations that participated today are all members of the Media Action Grassroots Network, or MAGNET. How many people have at least heard of MAGNET? Yeah. Yes. If you are not yet a member of MAGNET or you would like to join MAGNET, you can please talk to Betty, who's in the back. Betty, whoo! Or you can also go to the MAGNET website, which is magnet.org, mag-net.org. Mag yeah, mag and check that out. And it is these the opportunities that Magnet provides is not just about being able to participate and take action, but as someone was just speaking, this idea to be able to meet and connect with people and, and like-minded folks. Uh, for Media Literacy Project, for example, while we knew that People's Production House was also a member of Magnet, it wasn't until we were at a knowledge exchange two years ago that our organizations had the opportunity to actually meet and this idea of doing something about a cell phone kit came out of started at that time and so now that this kit is actually happening so it's also understanding that it is when organizations like Center for Media Justice and funders get together and create opportunities for us to sit down and have these conversations and really build together that sustainable collaborations happen. And so really, Magnet is a really wonderful place to participate in that kind of collaborative work. Uh, and, and that's going to be, you know, it's not short term. We're talking about long term movement building. And so again, just a huge thank you to everyone for being on this panel, for coming together today. and. Safe travels home for those of you that are headed back home today. Thank you. Woo!